welcome to the stage, Jay Beal. Hey, hey. Man, man, I'm at the show box. I feel like a, I feel like a rock star of some sort. I, I feel like I should start singing and dancing, but that's probably a different party. Um, well, maybe at the end, depending on how time runs. Okay, so hi, I'm Jay Beal. Um, I'm really happy to be uh, speaking here at Blue Hat. I've been coming to Blue Hat for years, and uh, I've always been the, you know, I've always been the Linux guy, and now the, you know, Linux and cloud guy. Um, and Microsoft used to be a Windows place with, you know, so Blue Hat's become, uh, Blue Hat, just like Microsoft, has become more modern and much cooler, at least to me, a Linux guy. So anyway, here's my title slide. I have a bio on all my slide decks, but since nobody reads bios, this is my C, this is, uh, replaces my sea of text with my graphical bio. So um, what we're going to do now is I'm going to talk to you about Kubernetes security, and we're going to do a ton of this by way of a demo. And so I'm going to talk to you, I try, I'm trying really, really hard to leave out the introductory material on what Kubernetes is, um, and the hard part is how many of you know a lot about Kubernetes or know what it is? Okay, how many of you don't? Give me hands, come on, be brave, there were tons of you. Okay, and then, anyone whose ar okay, who's arms didn't work? Cause like, yeah, okay, cool. So anyway, I'm gonna give you just the tiniest bit of a sense of what Kubernetes is and does, and from a slide perspective, I'm solely gonna do that from the perspective of talking about what I might attack. So, Short version, what is Kubernetes? Why does it exist? Imagine you're Google. You have two and a half million computers. That was an accurate number back in 2014 or so. You've got two and a half million computers. You are staging something around, the, around three billion workloads per week to those computers. They specific, specifically said containers. And you need some kind of system to, to manage it all. You need a system that's going to do a few things. One, it's going to figure out for any given workload whether that workload's going to last for three seconds or three days or three months, which machine should it be on? How do you do that with redundancy? Because when you have that many computers, you have hard drive failures. I think it comes out for Google to something like every 90 minutes by my calculation. Um, so you're starting workloads and you don't know whether they're actually going to finish because you don't know whether the computers they're on are going to fail because you have two and a half million machines. So that's part of what you're doing. The other part of what you're doing is basically saying, I'm trying to support this microservice thing. And you're gonna see that a whole bunch in the demo. Basically, I'm trying to say, hey, it's a heck of a lot faster if I wanna develop a piece of software instead of having 100 developers all working on one piece of software and trying to actually, and trying to actually coordinate so that they can release uh, once a year, we're gonna instead break that up into 10, into 10 microservices. So one piece of software, one application becomes 10 microservices. Each of those 10 gets a team of 10. That team of 10 can release a heck of a lot more often. And so what Kubernetes is comes entirely out of basically those two things. Wanting that kind of software-defined data center where infrastructure is code, and wanting to be able to get microservices and be able to say, how can I make a whole lot of different things um, run and be able to find each other and be able to work together? Because if you're going to have your application broken to 10 pieces, well, you're going to have 10 pieces that all need to find each other. They all need to be able to have a whole bunch of intelligence, and basically Kubernetes is going to provide that. So that was my what Kubernetes, what Kubernetes is for anybody who didn't know already. Hopefully the rest of you uh, do know. And um, here we are. So I'm going to talk about what you're attacking with Kubernetes. From an attacker's point of view, we've got kind of two classes of machine. You've got master nodes, and you've got worker nodes. The master node has some pieces. These are pieces we're going to attack. You have an API server. All of Kubernetes is basically an API-driven data center. So you've got this API server that basically gets all the requests, serves as first point of contact. You have an etcd server. Whatever the API server is asked to do, if it can be done, it stores that as the new state of the world in the etcd server. And the etcd server, SCD server says, OK, that's the state of the world. I'm tracking that. And then a whole bunch of other components are all basically subscribed to etcd and saying, hey, tell me whenever there's a new, pe a new workload that needs to be staged so I can decide where to stage it. Hey, let me know if anything else. And they're basically, you have all of Kubernetes basically looking at etcd and saying, OK, is the state of the world right now what it's supposed to be? Uh, what, what's stored in etcd? If it is, cool. If it isn't, I'll fix that. Um, so the nice thing is that means if you can get to etcd, you, the game's over. Um, 
You've got controllers, which are running these control loops, always checking that state of the world. You've got a scheduler doing that bid and packing, deciding where to put workloads. You've got kubedns, so that every one of the, every one of the internal or external network services can all be found, and they can all be found by name. And you'll see that a little bit in our demo. So let's talk about the, let's talk about the worker node stuff. All the machines running Kubernetes. Some of, I know some of you are like, what's the difference, difference between Kubernetes and Docker? All of the machines running Kubernetes are running a container runtime like Docker. They're also running a program called a kubelet, and that kubelet's kind of like a little mini API server for that node that just basically um, ties it into the rest of Kubernetes and accepts requests from the API server, accepts requests from the user, uh, especially if the user's an attacker and it's badly configured. Um, you've got the host operating system. We can attack though. We can attack that. The normal parts we could there. We can attack the workloads, the containers that are on the system, and we can attack all of the we can attack all of the proxying that gets traffic from one thing to another. So anyway, that was a lot of talk, and now I want to get to the fun part. Um, so who's seen Scott Pilgrim versus the World? And I need all arms working now. Who's seen it? Woo! -hoo. Who hasn't seen it? All arms working. Cool. Okay, we're about 50-50. So half the people in this room may, may, may or may not have good taste in movies, uh, depending on what you think. So what I'm going to do real quick is, provided everything works right, I'm going to give you a quick little YouTube video. The short version, this is just a tiny bit for anybody who's worried about copyright. Um, so the plot of Scott Pilgrim vs. the World, and this is tied deeply into Kubert. No, it isn't. The plot of, of Scott Pilgrim versus the world is this. Scott Pilgrim is this guy who seems to potentially be a comic book character or a video game character. It's not quite clear, but it, I mean, it seems like it's happening in the real world. Um, but really, Scott Pilgrim is basically like a musical is like a play that occasionally breaks into song for no reason. In Scott Pilgrim, it's kind of a movie that breaks into a video game world staged fight. Well, like I said, it might be comic book. You'd have to watch, watch the parts. It's really fun. It's on Netflix. The important plot point is that we have Scott Pilgrim, Michael Sarah, and uh, Scott Pilgrim wants to date Ramona Flowers. In order to date Ramona Flowers, he turns out has to defeat each of her seven evil exes. Um, and so what we're going to do is bust our way through a Kubernetes cluster, attacking, and each part of this will, each part of the demo will be defeating another evil X from the movie. So I'm not going to show you a spot of video the whole time, but I just want to kind of give you a quick flavor for what this world or what this movie looks like. And they've hooked me up with a hard line so that we have good internet. So this is our first evil X. He's just confronted. And we find, well, gosh, like I said, we're either in a video game or a comic book, because video games don't say poom, comic books do, but comic books don't have 64 hit counts. So anyway, the whole movie kind of works like this. And he'll explain just for a second. Well, well, well. You're quite the opponent, Pilgrim. Who the hell are you anyway? My name is Matthew Patel, and I'm Ramona's book, evil ex-boyfriend. For what? Anyone need another drink? And this is, and I will, I will, uh, I will take away the exciting part and move us back to the uh, boring parts. Uh, that's me. Um, and let me just fight PowerPoint for a second. Or maybe I'm fighting the Mac. I should remember who my, uh, who's putting me on a stage today. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, what Matthew Patel goes and explains is he's the first of the evil ex-boyfriends, and Scott Pilgrim has to fight him and kill him if he wants to defeat, if he wants to date, if he wants to date Ramona Flowers. Um, so what I've done is I've created, I have this uh, open source project. There's a, 
sticker that I have on my laptop and a, that I'll hand any of you that you that want, but I have this open source project and it's an intentionally vulnerable Kubernetes cluster. And you go and tell this cluster, hey, put yourself in one of these scenarios, and then you work your way through attacking the cluster and capturing flags, and as you get flags, you're kind of having fun with some movie. The first couple scenarios that are available for download right now, that's the Matrix. The new one, which I've done for you guys, is Scott Pilgrim. So anybody who downloads this, uh, this open source project, it, it's probably going to take a few weeks before this moves from being a cloud-based thing into the thing you can download, but uh, we'll get to play against this one. So here's our Kubernetes cluster. Our Kubernetes cluster is, uh, like a number I've found in penetration tests, hosting one critical app that's made up of a bunch of microservices. This app doesn't look all that critical. It's kind of 1999 uh, HTML-based forms or what have you. But it says, hey, welcome to the League of Evil Xs. Here are each of those evil Xs that have to be defeated. And it says, which bio would you like to see? And sorry, I've dropped my full screen thing. So I'm just going to move this guy and maybe shrink it a little like it was before. Urgh. OK, we're going to leave it floating there. So what I've got is this nice little web app. And it says, hey, which evil X do you want to, which evil X's bio do you want to see? I should note, some of you are in the back of the room. And you've got your own monitors. And the people in the front of the room, you've got, you've got a pretty big screen. But some of you in the back of the room, dead center, who can't see those monitors, I apologize. A bunch of my demos are done at this text size. And I've been furiously today uh, recrafting them to make them bigger. So if you're getting a little frustrated, realize somewhere, somewhere during this demo, we're going to switch to a bigger, a bigger font. Um, so here we go. We've got a web application. and. You can go and basically pull up an evil X's bio. If you go to Lucas Lee, the second one, you find this kind of debug message. It says, hey, this command failed. So it turns out your input's being passed into a, into a uh, shell command, which we all know from shell shock and lots of other things. That's a bad idea. Um, so let's go and tweak this. Let's go and see if, it, let's see if we can do something with it. So I'm going to choose that Lucas Lee. I'm going to intercept it with burp proxy. I've just taken a little proxy. You can get a plug in like this. Um, but I'm doing all of this from Kali Linux so that you can basically do everything you see here. You're kind of getting a quick free training. So everything you see here is something you could do by downloading Bustacoop, by downloading Kali Linux, both free. So I'm going to go and basically change um, this Lucas Lee thing. and I'm going to put a semicolon at the end and put ID. And when I do that, I find on the web page that I get, it says, oh, here's the user ID the web server is running as. Um, so that's, uh, that's good for me. And what that suggests is I could I'm running commands in here. So I'm going to send this to a tool called repeater. And I'm going to change that Lucas Lee evil X parameter. So instead of running ID, it's going to run a curl command. It's going to pull down a meterpreter shell, so, or a meterpreter binary, basically a, a remote access Trojan. And it's going to do it from my Kali system, which, through the magic of port forwarding, is located in AWS's cloud, not in Azure. Um, just because I didn't want anyone dragging me off the stage in handcuffs. So I've got Metasploit set up, and I'm going to catch that shell. So I just have a quick little RC file. This kind of shows you how you set up Metasploit to catch the shell that we're, that we're now. I've hit go, and now I've got a connection to the, uh, I've got a connection to my, um, uh, I've got a connection to the, from, that, from that pod. And so if I run bash right now, what, um, I'm going to stop for a second and just show you that I have this playback set on speed I'm, because uh, I type, I t I'm typing too slowly. So I've got a shell. I'm in a pod. And now what I'm going to do is stop for a second. So I have that bash shell. It's running in a container in Kubernetes. And now what I'm going to do is stop for a second and grab a copy of kube control. Not kube CTL, not kube cuddle, kube control. This is really important to the Kubernetes project, to the CNCF, and to extremely uh, uptight people everywhere. Um, so I'm going to grab a copy of kube control into the pod. I'm going to make it executable. And this is the cool thing about Kubernetes, is basically, um, uh, is basically that when you compromise a system in Kubernetes, you're in an API-defined data center, which means you have a chance of taking the entire data center over. Um, 
just using APIs, doing mostly nothing but curl commands. Kube control can, can be useful too. So I have to go and set this thing up. Um, uh, what I end up doing here is saying there's a service account token that's mounted into every single container, into every single pod in Kubernetes, unless you turn it off. And so I'm going to see what Matthew Patel's service account token can do. So to do that, I have to go and basically pass all these arguments in that say to kube control saying, here's where you find the service account. I've got to do all the things that, that ordinarily it would be code that would be doing. And I'll go and say, here's, you know, Kube control, every time I type kube control, I want it to be this whole set of arguments. And once I do that, I just run a quick get pods to find out whether it's working. That's kind of the first thing I do every single time. And what I see is each of the evil X's has their own pod. I have the Matthew Patel intro pod. I've got the Lucas Lee fan requests pod. Each of the X's that, uh, are, that are fought in the movie have their own pod. So I'm going to try some stuff here. I'm going to go and upload some YAML. Um, in Kubernetes, you basically do everything either with kube control on the command line or more popularly with YAML, yet another markup language, or JSON. So I'm going to go and basically upload some custom YAML. And that custom YAML is an attack pod. I want to basically see if I can put a mount my own pod on the cluster. If I can, then I've got, you know, I've got a lot, I've got a much better position to attack from. And it turns out, it basically says, nope, your service account isn't allowed to do this. OK. Well, can I list secrets? Uh, no. Darn it. OK, that would be where I might find passwords. I might find SS, you know, TLS certs. Um, I can still get pods. Let's see if I can execute into another one. Oh, nope, my user isn't allowed to execute. Each of those three things, if you're able to do them, turn out to be incredibly useful and get you um, and usually move things forward. So let's see what else I can do. I find a flag file, and the flag file says, hey, you've beat Matthew Patel, um, so look at your graphic. And here's our cool little graphic. And it says, now go after Lucas Lee. And Lucas Lee was the second evil X. He's played by the same guy who plays Captain America, Chris Evans. Um, he, his superpower turns out to be that he has uh, uh, eight stunt doubles or nine stunt doubles look just like him and all just spring out of nowhere. Um, but anyway, it turns out when I look at Lucas Lee, Lucas Lee has a, Lucas Lee is a microservice here. And one of the big things in Kubernetes is a lot of your attack, a lot of what you do as an attacker is basically say from outside the cluster, I can only see one thing. I can see this web server. From inside the cluster, I often get to be able to see everything. I often get network access to just tons of things that I would never have access to in the, uh, normally. That's a basically default setting. So what I find here is this cool little API, and it says, hey, this API takes two things. It takes bio, which is that thing that shows me Lucas Lee's bio, but it also takes, as in the movie, grindy thingy. Um, which is how uh, Scott defeats him. He asks him, he, he goads him into doing a, a, uh, a grind on a skateboard. And uh, if we pass in grindy thingy, we get a quote from the movie. It says, hey, you really think you can goad me into doing a trick like this, like that? And, uh, and uh, uh, our hero says, there are girls watching, at which point he grabs his skateboard and basically uh, kills, himself with a, kills himself trying to do a grind down uh, 300, uh, 300 feet worth of steps, basically. So the cool thing is, this microservice says it'll run things for us if we just pass, them, pass commands in base64 encoded. Um, so let's do that. Now, you won't, as an attacker, usually find the microservices are just saying, hey, I'll run whatever command you want. But we're kind of on the easy level. And, it's, uh, and I'm trying to work my way through seven evil X's. Um, the, uh, this would often be where you'd have some other kind of flaw that gets, you more, that gets you more access. So in this case, I've made it simple remote command execution. And what I found is I can run an ID command that says I'm root. And now I'm going to make my next command, that same kind of pull down my interpreter binary and, um, and run it. And if I skip forward just a little bit, what I find is that if I pull that binary down, if I base64 encode that, the binary gets pulled, gets pulled from the web server I'd staged. And I'll have a new session. And I'm just fast forwarding because it's a lot of typing. 
So I'll get that new session, and now I am, come on, and now I'm in a different pod called Lucas Lee Fan Requests. And for all of you who've been bummed about the, uh, who've been bummed about our font size, up till now, it's about to get much better. Because now we're in something that I had. So now from here, we're in Lucas Lee's pod. Our next evil ex is Todd Ingram. This guy played Superman and now plays the Atom on, uh, for some reason, all these comic book people all stick, to, st stick in the same movies. They get typecast a little bit. But this is a fun one. So if, you're, if, you've seen other, if you've seen other Kubernetes attack talks before, this is something that I've actually never seen in any of them. It's kind of new. It's kind of cool. It was a little hard to pull together. Um, and it was even harder to go and do twice. So this is, a, this is a fun one. And what it says is, our flag here says, OK, now you're going to face Scott Pilgrim. We're always trying to get Scott Pilgrim to, to eat something that isn't vegan. And the reason is that in the movie, Scott Pilgrim has basically Jedi telekinetic powers that entirely come out of not eating any of the, you know, dairy, meat, uh, eggs. Um, and so what we're going to do is, the thing is, the other thing is that Todd is basically really dumb. And so our story here, to bring us back into Kubernetes, is that uh, we've just broken, broken into a microservice. Now we're going after another one. Um, and that one actually consults another one. So we're going to man in the middle. We're going to man in the middle microservice three, trying to reach microservice four. So Lucas Lee, we're going to ask him if he wants to eat something that's not vegan. If we can get him to eat something that's not vegan, we win. He's going to go and take whatever we asked, is it vegan or not, and consult a microservice and say, hey, is this vegan? And if the microservice says, yes, you can eat it, yes, it's vegan, he'll eat it, and we will win. So um, the cool thing about Kubernetes, or maybe not cool thing, is that everything's based on labels. So if I want to get Todd, if I want a man in the middle of the traffic coming out of this, coming out of Todd Ingram's pod, that's going to the next evil ex, Roxy Richter, what I want to do is figure out what service, um, what service Todd's talking to, and then I want to impersonate it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at I'm, I'm gonna, this, this demo, uh, sorry, this flag tells me, use this, use this thing to ask him to eat gelato. Use this thing to ask him to eat tofu. So we can try that out real quick with a couple of these. Ask him about eating gelato. Um, he says he won't eat it. I'm going to do kube control get services. I get that list of services. These services are all the internal load balancers. Um, remember, uh, the designers of Kubernetes basically said that any workload that you run, you should probably be running two or three of them because a computer could crash and because the program could crash. So what you do is instead of saying, I'd like to, I'd like to talk to that machine, please, or that virtual machine or whatever, you say, I'd like to talk to that service. And that service then sends your traffic, load balances your traffic, and sends it to one of the pods that matches its selector cool thing is that selectors labels, and if you know the labels for something else, you can make your workload have the same labels and get its traffic. So this is what we're going to do. So we're, we got a list of services. We're going to get the YAML that defines the is it vegan service he's checking. And this tells us here's the cluster IP that's been assigned, but here's the selector. Any pods that have, any pods in the default namespace that have, the, uh, that have the label app set to evil x4, that's Roxy Richter's number, will get this traffic. So I've gone and built a man in the middle pod. And this man in the middle pod is running my own container image. But it also happens to have that same label, app evil x4. So I've set that label. So now I'm going to apply that pod to the cluster. Now that pod exists. And now when I ask Todd to eat it, I got lucky this time. What's going to happen in general is Todd's going to sometimes try my evil X pod and sometimes try the real one. So if I ask Todd enough questions, within two or three tries, uh, the statistics guy just got off the stage. So roughly within two or three tries, um, Todd's going to come and ask me instead of the thing he's supposed to ask. And so when he asks me, he says, uh, yeah, that, yeah, gelato's vegan. I'll eat that. At which point the vegan police show up. He says, no, and he coughs up his token. And this, this, this is a Kubernetes service count token. It's basically a, it's a JSON web token, a JWT. Um, so you could base 6040 code it and learn more about it. But I can take that token, pass it into kube control, and I can impersonate Todd now. So because I'm man in the middle traffic going to him, um, 
and that was our success condition. He died, he gave us this token, and we are now in his pod, and we can cut out his flag. It says, you defeated Todd Ingram, so let's look at the, uh, let's look at, from the movie, Todd Ingram's death scene involves a, uh, a de-veganizing ray, and that's in my next video. So here's our flag. A little bit of overlap. Deveganizing Ray. Hit him. Zoom. And Todd Ingram le loses all of his special vegan powers. Uh, in the movie, he actually, just in case any of you are thinking it's not fair that he could just screw up once and eat gelato, in the movie, he ate gelato uh, and didn't know if it was vegan or not, to which to which he, someone says, anybody want to say the line for me so I don't have to curse on stage? It's milk and eggs, bitch. Um, right, so then, uh, so then he, uh, he ate chicken parmesan and Scott Pilgrim t tricks him into drinking half and half. So anyway, um, here we go. Now we gotta get to the next evil ex, Roxy Richter. And she's the one who was operating that Is It Vegan microservice. Remember, the cool thing is that microservice wasn't reachable before, but because we've been hopping through, we're getting access, we're getting access to all these back-end programs that we wouldn't have been able to access before. And they weren't getting the same level of code out of their fuzzing because they weren't directly accessible to anybody. But now they kind of are, or they're at least a little more accessible. So let's take a look at Todd's microservice program just to get the URL. So he's been, we, he's been submitting his request to, is it vegan? And this is what a Kubernetes service looks like. You basically say, is it vegan? And you say what labels, what labels any traffic going to that should go to, and it goes to whatever pods uh, get the is it vegan traffic. Now I've removed my man in the middle pod, and we try our little, our little test again, that curl, uh, but we're gonna send to this, to this microservice, is it vegan, some food, and we're gonna pass in the half and half, and it says, hey, no, you don't wanna keep that out of your coffee, that's not vegan. So if we base 64 decode that, it turns out it's just a JSON, it's just a, a JSON, a JSON serialization um, from the node from the uh, uh, from the node serialization library, which is permanently broken. It just has an RCE, and they're not fixing it. Um, so there's tons of code out there this, with this same flaw, and uh, and by the flaw I mean that that library, if you pass in. Anything you want, if you, pass in some J if you pass in some JavaScript code like that's embedded as a JSON object, then, that, then anything that deserializes that JSON object using this particular library that they are not fixing and it's been had this vulnerability for years um, will, run, will run your code. And so we're going to pass that in. So all we're doing is basically consulting the same thing that Todd was, and we're doing it from Todd's pod. That gets us past the network controls. And when we do that, we end up, let's go back into Metasploit. We end up getting another session. So we've got a shell, and now we're in Roxy Richter's pod, which was running a quick little Node.js application. We can look at the flag, and the flag says, okay, you've defeated Roxy Richter. Can you defeat the Katanagi twins? And the Katanagi twins, their thing is that they are running a Redis service. And now we're, unfortunately, I'm sorry, back in the uh, smaller text. Um, but they're running a Redis service. That Redis service has no password, which there were tons of Redis, Redis servers out on the internet that had no passwords. Um, the creator actually said, are you people dumb? You should never expose it to the internet. Here, I'll show you how easy it would be to get, RC, to, to get code execution if you were to put your Redis server on the internet. And so he does a, he does a post. Um, he does a post and he links up on, I don't think it was Reddit, it was maybe Ain't It Cool News and then got linked on Reddit and the whole world knew about it. And then we got a whole bunch of worms, including one called Redis Wanamine that would use Redis to, that would use Redis to install uh, 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 Bitcoin mining or cryptocurrency mining on, on servers. So we're gonna use that same, that same vulnerability inside the cluster. Somebody thought this thing was safe because it was in a cluster and it wasn't reachable from the internet and it turns out it's not. So I've created a quick little script for this called exploit Redis. And it's similar to, the what's, on that, to what's on that web page, except that the one on the web page has been crippled uh, just a little bit, and so I've fixed it up. 
But um, the cool thing is, I think I skipped past the point where we're reading the flag, but the flag for the Katanagi brothers, the Katanagi twins, said, hey, by the way, these guys have mounted slash home slash Redis into the pod um, because they just, they need a volume mount. And they, need, they want persistent data and, the, uh, and Redis, and basically the whole deal with Kubernetes with with pods is the, the primary pattern is uh, non-persistent. Is basically the idea that any pod could die at any time, heck, any node could die at any time, and that should all be fine. And so people will go and do workarounds. And I got a, actually got a question earlier today from somebody who was talking about this. Um, and I'm like, yeah, actually, that's one of my demos. Um, so in this case, the Katanagi brothers have, have linked in home Redis straight into their, straight into their container that's running Redis, so when we compromise Redis, we're able to put an SSH key on one of the nodes in this cluster. And when we finish with that Redis compromise, here's where we are. So we're now on the cluster. And this is the point where, this is the point, this is the, po this is the part of Kubernetes attack that I enjoy the most. And what it is, is I'm going to say, okay, I'm in, I'm in the cluster, I'm running on some node in the cloud provider. In this case, Amazon's, don't worry. Right? And the cloud provider, well, they, they make all kinds of nice little services available. There's all kinds of APIs. Uh, my favorite API, my fir favorite, fir my, well, I have a few favorite APIs. One of my favorite APIs is S3, because lots of stuff often stored publicly that shouldn't be. But my other favorite API is the metadata API, because if, you're, if you get code execution on anything running on a cloud provider, if you can reach this special, this special URL, 169.254, 169.254, the actual, a what the API does beyond that differs by provider, but that IP address seems to be uniform. So if you can reach that IP address, you can get an account for the machine or for the instance that you're running on, and that will even happen in some serverless environments. So I'm gonna go to 169.254, 169.254, latest metadata, and it gives me a list of things that I might ask for like my IP address or what have you. But I don't want my IP address. I want to say, for I am, I would like my security credentials, please. And it says there's, there's one security credential here, starts with masters, ends with bust a cube. So I'm going to put that string that it says are my security credentials in and ask for it. And what I get back are the things that you configure into your AWS command line client to go and, well, like I'm going to do here, uh, take a look at S3. So I've done some copy and paste to make this go a little faster, and I'm copying in those, that access key ID, the, the secret access key, and the session token into environment variables, and I'll run AWS S3 LS, and it'll say, you're not allowed to list buckets. But luckily, my flag, I said luckily my flag, luckily the flag, when I compromised these guys, said, hey, you've beaten the Katanagi twins, can you take down the whole cluster? By the way, the cluster was built with the cops one of the major Kubernetes installers is called COPS, K-O-P-S, and it keeps its state store in a bucket called SplunkConf, BustaKubeCom state store. And so I'm going to take that bucket name, and I'll do AWS S3 LS, and it says, okay, there's just one content. Cool, let me go and take that and get a list of that. Well, that's got add-ons, backup, instance groups, manifests, PKI. That's starting to sound interesting. Secrets sounds better, though. Let's look at secrets. Oh, it's got a bunch of files. These files are named for the major service accounts that were used to, that were, that were created at the time the cluster was installed to bootstrap the cluster. I wonder if any of those, you know, potentially long-lived ones still work. Let's grab the admin one. So I'm going to go and use an AWS command, copy. I'm just going to download that admin token. I'll call it admin token. And I get it downloaded because I'm trying to download to a directory that my user can't write to. So I'll do it again. And when I base64 decode this, what I end up with is this nice little, nice little uh, JSON block. And the JSON block says data, and then the data contents are a token for the Kubernetes cluster. And so when I uh, base64 decode that into my admin token file, I can look at that, and I can run a kube control command, hyphen hyphen token, just like I did with the attack on Todd, get pods. OK, get pods just to make sure it works. But now let's see if we can do something we shouldn't be able to do. So I've just chosen, uh, why don't we exec into the chaos theater one, OK? 
That was cool, I could do that, but let me try something else. I'm created, I've got this attack pod that I couldn't stage earlier, because I didn't have rights. And this pod, I'll show you in just a second, this pod is allowed to, is like first it's custom, second, it's allowed to, it's allowed to mount host files, the, uh, the node host file systems. So I've, I've done it, I've created it, and now let's take a look. I go into that pod, and I should have my flag, which would be nice, but let's do a cheroot, root, bin bash. So I'm going and saying, this pod basically is mounting the node, so I'm in a container, in a container, in a pod, that pod is mounting the node, the host's root file system into slash root. And if I can do that, I get lots of privilege. So I've trooted, so when I type Etsy shadow, what I'm seeing is on the node. So now I've got access to read the shadow file, and uh, I ended my demo there, but if I kept going with that, um, sorry, if I kept going with that, then uh, I could do quite a bit. Um, I've actually, I actually have a tool that I'm gonna show you next called Parades, and if it finds this capability, if it can mount a pod that can mount the host file system, it'll go and say, write a cron tab file. And writing that cron tab file will basically have a, we'll, we'll set it up so that that node is once a minute sending a reverse shell back to the attacker. So if I can modify the host file system on one of the nodes in the cluster, then I've actually ended up getting command execution on the node itself, kind of indirectly through the file system, but I'll take it. None of what we've been doing here, by the way, has been anything that any, that's got a CVE attached to it. This is all just normal red teaming or penetration testing, whatever you want to call it, this is abusing configuration. And there are some security controls on this thing, but I'm just kind of walking around them. And because the, our talk format's short, I'm not showing you like all the other things I wasn't able to do, and I'm kind of walking around through that. I'll have a longer version of this online um, in a little while. So, um, so that's, the, uh, that's our last thing. I want to show you, I've got, a, I've got some slides, and I want to show you one more demo. And I just have to remember how to find my playlist. There we go. So this is a tool that we created in Guardians. It's another open source tool like Bustacoob is. Um, and this one's called Parades. It doesn't have much of a UI. It's kind of text-based interactive. But what it lets you do is if you get code execution in a pod, so that's if you get it from a fish developer, if you get it from compromising, from compromising a workload, you're in a pod, and what you can do is basically, say, is basically use a bunch of command line things that automate the kinds of things I've been doing. So it'll go and say, hey, do you want to see if you're able to list the secrets out of the API server, maybe get some service account tokens from it? Do you want to check the, uh, do you want to check the uh, AWS or GCP metadata APIs and see if you can get service accounts for, or, or IAM accounts? Do you want to see if you can, um, if you can basically get, take control of the cluster by way of the cloud account? And so I've got one quick demo here that's of Parades doing that. So I'm, this is, a, this is a, a sample thing. I'm in a WordPress. I mean, so I've just compromised WordPress because WordPress never gets compromised, right? So I've got remote code execution inside of WordPress, and I want to turn that into something bigger. Um, this thing's on GCP, is on uh, Google's cloud. So I'm just going to run a couple commands. I'm going to run number 13, which says, hey, go and check the... Um, Go and check the uh, metadata API and see if you can get some IAM credentials. So I get some IAM credentials. These are, just the, these are just standard ones. They're not administrative in any way. They're just what basically the nodes had. And now I run 15 and say, can you see if you can find service account tokens in Google Cloud Storage, Google's equivalent of S3? Yep, those same kind of ones we just got. So once, I, once those all scroll by, it says, ah, these are all the ones we've acquired from GCS. And now let's take that admin one and we'll use that, and then we can just see if, like, let's test and see if that's really admin. So I'll switch to the kube system namespace, and I'm gonna just run a command in every single pod on the cluster. Or every single pod in this namespace. Yep, sounds like I got code execution on all of the infrastructure in this Kubernetes cluster. And that was automated, one tool, two commands, and we're done.
So that's kind of fun. So that's my, uh, that's my demo. I like to do talks that are, that are very, very demo focused. What I'm going to do now is talk to you a little bit about Fence. So uh, clearly I had some slides. I had a slide that basically was there to tell you what we were doing with the whole movie tie-in. Um, Busta Cube is the cluster we were operating against, so ask me for a sticker later on. That's the Kubernetes logo with a, you know, broken up. I'm going to talk about defenses right now. So here are the kinds of defenses that you have. Some of these were deployed on this cluster and some of them weren't. We have, first, we've got network policies. That sounds so boring. Like, it's the most boring way in the world to say firewalling, but basically, you have network policies. Um, you have pod security policies, and I've got a slide. So the network policies basically define, there's some YAML, and they define what pods can be reached by what things. And here's the more important thing. We shouldn't, from, that, from, any, from any of those workloads, we shouldn't have been able to reach the metadata API or reach the AWS or, GC, or, uh, or GCP APIs unless we actually had a need to. And most of the time, we don't. Like WordPress probably didn't need to reach out to those APIs. So if I have an egress policy in place, and that's not default by far, and it's really uncommon, but if I have an egress policy in place, then I don't, I don't end up with my attacker able to reach all of those APIs and do the kind of damage we were doing. Um, we also can make it so that the attacker isn't like, I didn't hop between X's, I didn't go from X number one to X number three, um, because I had network policies that prevented that. Um, what else? So, Pod security policies are one of the big places where you get a ton of defensive power. Um, and pod security policies basically say, here, as the owner of the cluster, or as the owner of a namespace in a cluster, you can basically say, no pods, no workloads can be deployed on my cluster unless they have these defenses. And so one is you can basically have a, a, a volume whitelist. You can say, you, the pods in my cluster can mount this from NFS, or they can mount this uh, from the host file system, but they can't just mount the root file system on the node they're on. That's insane. And that's a really easy thing to set up. You can also have what are called root capability limits, and that is that if you've got, and I honestly, I do defense, like I do defense as a you know, full day class, so I'm giving you the quick, uh, a quick rundown. I can do capability limits, and that's kind of cool, because all of root special powers, the ability to like write to any file they want on the system, whether they own it or not, all of those special powers are actually numbered. And so you can make it so that you can have something run in a container on a cluster, and it's got root privilege. It's, got, it, it's running as root, but it doesn't have the ability to write arbitrarily the file system, or it doesn't have the ability to bind to a port below 1024. Literally, the only root special powers it would have would be the ones that are known, the ones that are in its profile. And so you can say anything running on my cluster has to have one of these profiles. You can do app armor. Um, if Crispin Cohen's in the house, way to go, man. He's a, um, um, you can do set comp, syscall whitelisting, like browsers have been doing, where basically you can say, even though you're not the developer of the program, you can put a set comp profile on it. What's a set comp profile? It means all the system calls that a program calls, um, you can make a profile and say, the program can only run the system calls that it normally runs. And that profile comes straight out, can, comes straight out of S-Trace. Um, you can do read-only root file systems, which really would have gotten my way going and pulling my remote access Trojans down. Um, and uh, you can do service meshes. And I've just kind of talked through my table of contents slide. So I talked about the syscall whitelisting, basically saying what system calls does the program normally use? Let's restrict it to just those. Um, I talked about read-only root file systems, and uh, I've talked, to, uh, and I'm, gonna, I'm mentioning service meshes now. So this is Istio, but you can have a service mesh, and that service mesh is service meshes are incredibly powerful. They are some heavy lifting, but once you've got it, it's really, really nice. What they let you do, among other things, they do let you have control and say only these things can reach this can reach these things. My man in the middle trick never would have worked with the service mesh in place. Um, but you also make it so that you've got you've got encryption added between every single pod that interacts with anything else, whether it, whether it was coded for it or not, it gets encryption. It also gets you know full on you know full on certificate checking and basically you're authenticating the endpoints. Um, and this is another open source project. There are a few of them. This one's Istio, but there are, there's another one, Linkerd, that's also free. Um, I talked about Parades, um, and then I've got 
um, I talked about Parati's uh, and showed you a demo of that. Basically, it's a penetration testing tool. I actually thought I was going to run short on time, and I'm at a minute and 23 seconds, so woo! Um, uh, so anyway, some quick references. These are the kinds of things that we did in the demo, like the kinds of attacks. And I'm going to, at some point, I'm going to put together like the kind of like MITRE attack framework for Kubernetes. But I, as an attacker, I can ask the API server, which is basically the bulk of what I did here, to stage a container. I can ask it to modify containers. I can ask it to let me man in the middle traffic. Um, I can put in my own. I can basically, it's a software-defined data center. So if I have the privileges, I can do anything that that would let me do. I can run commands in containers I don't own. The cool thing is that until a few versions back, a default behavior was if you could reach the kubelet process on any of the nodes, you could ask the kubelet to let you run commands in any, po in any container on the system on that node, and it would. Um, and that was kind of like just game over, easy compromise. So um, finally, the other kind of attacks we did, we, this is basically what we just did. We interacted with the cloud provider. We get the credentials for the node from the metadata API. Um, we get uh, authentication tokens and then use the, out, of the, out of the cloud storage buckets, just basically searching and seeing what I can do. Um, yeah, I'm like watching my 1098, and this is awesome. So I, I have so much more to share with you, and I'd love to share it. I really hope you'll come and meet me in the speaker's corner, which I'm told is basically right over there. So um, yeah, come talk to me about Kubernetes attacks. Come get a sticker. Uh, come tell me about something cool you did in cloud native or in, uh, um, yeah, or in Linux hacking or in Windows hacking for that matter. Thank you very much.